Hello, everyone. This is Bethlehem Atfield. Welcome to the podcast Journey to Ethiopia with a story. This is a special program to commemorate International Translation Day, which is celebrated on the 30th September every year. Last year, we had an interesting discussion with Roman Toldebrahan, a writer, translator, and co founder of Romanat Books and Publishing. Our guest this year is Jane Katz, an award winning author, an educator, and a devoted advocate for developing children's reading culture. She grew up mostly in Ethiopia, where she now does a lot of volunteer work for helping kids to get books. Jane was born in Portland, Oregon, but when she was two years old, her parents moved to Ethiopia. Jane grew up in Maji, a small town in the southwest corner of the country. She is a co-founder of a non-profit organization, Ethiopia Reads, that works to bring books, libraries, and literacy practices to the children in Ethiopia. After 15 years on the board of directors of Ethiopia Reads, Jane saw a crucial missing piece of the literacy work and turned her volunteer effort to heading a creative team of Ready, Set, Go books, a project of open hearts, big dreams. These are a series of bilingual early readers to increase literacy in indigenous Ethiopian languages. So far, they have managed to publish over 135 bilingual books in local Ethiopian languages and other regional and international languages. Hi, Jane. Welcome to this podcast program, and uh, thank you for making the time to talk to me. Of course. Thank you so much for having me on. You were in Malaysia about two weeks ago, receiving an IBBY award. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Can you tell us um, what that is and what it means to you and to your work? Of course. It turns out I didn't really know the background of IBI myself. We just say IBI for that organization. But it came out of some work that a woman did after the end of World War II, when, of course, so many cities in Europe had been bombed. There were so many children that were distressed. In some cases, they didn't even have families. They were just running around on the street trying to survive. And she was given a task of trying to do something for the children. And she thought about books and how much a child can get from reading a book. And the publishers had paper shortages at that time because of the war. So publishers didn't have books to donate, but children in other countries donated books to her. And she set up these reading centers and places for children to have their art that showed what they were going through or what they had gone through. And that whole concept of using books to try to draw nations closer together Mm -hmm. and to try to be a force for peace in the world led to the formation of this organization, which is nationwide, uh, global. It's It's every nation that wants to be involved and start a chapter can be part of IBI. Their headquarters are in Switzerland, and they have these World Congress gatherings every other year where people come from all over the world to learn from each other about children's books. Mm -hmm. So there was a Chinese foundation that is working on getting books from the urban parts of China out into the rural areas. Mm -hmm. It's called the I Read Foundation. They gave money to Ibi okay. to give an award uh, to people that are trying to do similar work around the world that are trying to promote reading. And the U.S. chapter, U.S. BBY, nominated me as one of the many people that was nominated around the world. And I was very honored. There was a woman from Iran who was the other winner. Two of us were winners for work that we do around the world trying to help books reach children everywhere. So it was it was a great honor, and I got to go there and get my award and meet people from other parts of the world who are all working on getting children's books to children. That's fantastic. So I hope it inspires you more. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Absolutely. I came home with some materials, including the fact that all over the world, 
countries are looking at how to help children with disabilities mm -hmm. not be invisible and yeah. be seen in the pages of books. So I came home with a whole catalog mm -hmm. of books that Ibby has held up as good examples. And, and I'm sending it to one of our people in, that works on my team that has been working with Ethiopian artists and writers to do that very thing. So I know that there'll be a lot of inspiration. And we got to hear from the award-winning illustrator because Ibby gives the Hans Christian Andersen Award to a, a writer and an illustrator. Mm -hmm. So we got to hear from the illustrator who was in South Korea, who lives in South Korea. And I was saying, oh, I just, I would love to bring this knowledge of children's books and this idea of what illustrators do to more Ethiopian artists, mm -hmm. because there are so many people in Ethiopia doing creative visual work and, and helping them see that people around the world are putting their best art into books for children. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that I came back inspired about and, and thinking that I really want to do more with. Oh, okay. Um, but what started it all? I mean, what inspired you to begin with um, to publish and distribute books for children in indigenous Ethiopian languages? I um, was born in Portland, Oregon, where I live now. But when I was two years old, my parents made the decision to go to Ethiopia to work for the Presbyterian Church there. So, of course, I had no say in the matter. I went off to Ethiopia as a two-year-old. And I myself learned to read in Ethiopia in a quite a rural area in Maji, down mm -hmm. in southwestern Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. The Presbyterians were running a clinic and a school, and I got to see children who had the chance to go to school for the first time. In fact, many of them were teenagers because mm -hmm. they had never had a chance to learn to read and write before then. And I saw the excitement over reading and writing and even though I was being taught by my mother, because I was being taught to read in English, mm -hmm. and they at that time were being taught in Amharic, I just saw how excited, how exciting it is to get a chance to go to school and especially learning how to read. Mm -hmm. So fast forwarding many, many years, decades, I now have Ethiopian American grandchildren, and I was very interested in some kind of project that would help help my my granddaughter and my grandson who live in America, but I wanted them to do something with me that would help them learn more about Ethiopia. And I thought that this would be a wonderful project where I could put my author hat on, mm. um, but I could also engage them in it. So they were they were young at that point. My grandson was a third grader when I got this idea. My granddaughter was a fifth grader. Now they're teenagers, so now it's harder to mm -hmm. <laughs> get them involved, although my granddaughter just did art. Um, she asked me if I had any ideas, and based on the kinds of art she likes to do, I told her to look at Ethiopian baskets because mm -hmm. I said they're so colorful and they have patterns, and you love doing that kind of art. So she's she's done some art for me recently. Now I'm, I'm trying to get her to mail it to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Doing the art was the fun part. Getting it in the post office isn't so fun, I think. Mm -hmm. But uh, so that was actually a big part of my my push. Another reason that I wanted to do these books is that I had volunteered for about 15 years helping raise money to plant libraries for children. Mm -hmm. And we were shipping books in English for those libraries. But my brother, who visited one of the libraries with me, pointed out that there were rooms full of books in English, but the children were lined up at a shelf mm -hmm. where there were books in local languages. And he was a, an English language learner teacher at that time. Mm -hmm. And he said that the research shows that if you learn to read in your own language, then that reading can spill over more easily into other languages. So I began to see that if Ethiopia is going to solve its, its reading problem, which I was volunteering to work on, that there really had to be books that would be in more children's local languages in Ethiopia. Um, thanks for that. 
you mainly work with volunteers to um, produce these books. How do you mobilize volunteers? And uh, do you have um, a strong multilingual editorial team? The reason I'm asking is with the booming of self-publishing, I believe the quality of material being published is suffering. So how do you deal with that kind of problem? That is a really good question because the way that we we could never really interest a publisher here in the U.S. to publish these books because it's such a small market. Mm -hmm. And so luckily these days the technology exists to do self-publishing. But you're absolutely right. I, I teach in an MFA program, a Master's of Fine Arts, and I teach people who want to become writers of of books for children so I have a high respect for the the craft and and the difficulty of it it's far more difficult than it looks and a lot of people think it's easy and produce a book that in my opinion isn't our very best our very best way of writing a story for children so luckily we have my eye in there as someone who has spent her life writing children's books, teaching children's literature, reading children's books, including to my children and grandchildren. So I have a lot of background because of that. But the other thing that's important is to have to bring in editorial teams. Yeah. So even if I write something, there are multiple people that look at it and give me suggestions of how to make it better. We have, at this point, the translation, and translation is an art. Some mm -hmm. people think, well, anybody can translate <laughs> a, a children's book. It's simple. But we learn that's, that's not true. Translation is just like writing. You have to have a feel for the words. You have to have a feel for the sentences. You have to have that pleasure of being a good writer. At this point, I'm in charge. My team is in charge of just the Amharic. And our Amharic translation goes through three steps, three different people now, mm -hmm. because we've just learned the value of conversation. Is this word better or is that word better? Yeah. Is this sentence good? You know, just having more than one person look at it and be engaged is the way that we're trying to make it better. When it then goes to the the team that's in Seattle, they are doing translation into other Ethiopian languages, mm -hmm. and they always work with a translator and an editor. Right. So for the Amharic, we have three steps, but for all the other languages, there are at least two people that work mm -hmm. on the each translation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. It's a huge job, as you can imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now we've stepped into translation, so I'm going to ask more translation-related <laughs> questions. In your opinion, is getting Amharic fiction uh, translated into other Ethiopian and international languages significant, and why? I tend to think that the whole world needs to be reading each other's books, yeah. each other's literature. Mm -hmm. There's, It's so wonderful when someone is a good writer because they give us a glimpse into another world and you tap into what that person, that writer knows and what that writer feels and what that writer has experienced or is able to imagine. I love it that in the U.S. there is such a push right now to make sure that many voices are represented. Okay. So that's one way to make sure that we're, we're broadening our worlds with what we read. But of course, another way and something that Ibi really puts a focus on is how can we get more books from other countries into the United States, for example. Mm -hmm. And I use the United States because it is the big publishing, the big toad in the puddle, to use an idiom. It's mm -hmm. the big dominant publishing force in the world. So there's a lot of push from organizations like Ibi Mm -hmm. to have the publishers in America pay attention to books that are being written in other places and art that's being done in other places and how to bring it to the United States audience. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we can only have good things happen as we learn to read each other's literature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm really impressed with what you do uh, in in writing in multilingual uh, languages, and especially for children, because they grow up um, 
valuing the multiple languages. But um, my concern is for the already existing huge corpus of, uh, for example, Amharic contemporary fiction, which is limited to readership within the country because of the language barriers. What do you think needs to be done to facilitate access for global readership and who should be the main actors in getting this done? It's a tough question. I have I have bitten off a little a little tiny ear of corn yes. for myself to yeah. chew. Yeah. And somebody else really needs to work on the question about how to get those books that are have been written in languages like Amharic translated and available. I know there's no easy answer because I have just heard enough conversations over the decades to know there are people working on that, um, that whole question of how to get more international books available around the world. One thing I can say is, again, the technology is on our side, mm -hmm. because even though it's not easy to self-publish a high-quality book, it's possible. And when I started out as a young woman wanting to publish books, that wasn't even a possibility. So I do know that it can be done on a small scale, which is good, because mm -hmm. the bigger publishers need to sell lots of books to be able to pay their editors, pay their rent. You know, their expenses are huge, and they tend to go for the books that will sell the most copies. That's right. When you have something like this, which is really called a niche market, you have to find the sometimes nonprofit publishers hmm. or the, um, the smaller individual organizations that have a real, a real mission for doing the work, whether or not the economics of it end up producing a lot of money for anybody in the system. Hmm. I don't really know who is working on that for the adult side. I know that when I spoke at the US BBY mm -hmm. conference, there we heard from three publishers that are working on it in the children's field, one nonprofit, two profit. The two that are profit making companies pointed out that it's they won't really make any money at this for yeah. probably a decade. Mm -hmm. So even if you have a publisher that is set up to be for profit, they have to have capital and they have to be able to withstand, <laughs> from what I hear, a lot of years of, of not making money at it. Yeah. You know, the tough thing is that paper is expensive. Paper mm -hmm. is expensive all around the world. And again, we have the ability now to read on many kinds of devices yeah. Maybe that will be the answer. I know it isn't the answer for kids in Ethiopia mm -hmm. because the the yeah, internet and yeah. the computer services aren't there in the schools and, mm -hmm. and even in the, the private schools hardly have that capacity. But maybe for adults that it will be the answer. Yeah, like you said, it, what you're doing is amazing, but it's a very, very small, like, chip. It's just starting. Um, and I, my feeling is, like, it's not something you can do at individual or even commercial levels. So from your experience with uh, EB and, uh, um, and other countries, I'm thinking bigger institutes and even governments and states um, should be collaborating to do something uh, as significant as a national corpus to get translated. Uh -huh. did, you, did you get a sense of that with the Chinese, Malaysian, Hong Kong kind of settings? I was just thinking about China. So again, yeah. my own experience is only in the children's book field. Mm. But I was interviewed by a young woman living in China for this Ibi Award, and she was shocked to hear that Ethiopia doesn't have a publishing infrastructure because um, China is working hard on getting more books to the population, but they have publishers that are in there devoting money to that. And I... I know Ethiopia has many, many demands on its money. Yeah. Again, I'm only looking at it from a child's point of view, and they still haven't managed to get the educational system working for most children. At, mm. at these reading summits that Ethiopia Reads has set up, the Ministry of Education has done reports, and they've, they've showed that really, so far, Ethiopia, when when children are tested across the country, Reading hasn't 
isn't doing very well. Mm -hmm. So I know there's many, many demands on on the money that any country has. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I think is, I always try to point out that here in the U.S., initially publishing wasn't done as a way to make a lot of money. Publishing was only expected to spread ideas. I'm thinking way back to the time of people like Emily Dickinson, you know, Mm -hmm. or even let's say Charles Dickens who um, published some of his work in newspapers. Mm -hmm. It wasn't seen as something that couldn't necessarily make a lot of money and libraries. I've just been reading again about Andrew Carnegie who came to the U S as a, as a, 12 year old or 13 year old and was working in a factory and never got a chance to go to school but a man in his in his city opened his private home for some of these boys to be able to come in and read mm-hmm. and Andrew Carnegie became a, a avid reader mm-hmm. and later when he became a very wealthy man he gave away a lot of his money to build libraries because mm-hmm. he said that he thought that's how he had his chance and he wanted other people to have their chances too. So we're used to it being in the United States, for example, counties and cities fund their libraries, Mm -hmm. but that's not the way it used to be. It used Mm -hmm. to be private individuals doing it and it used to be nonprofits doing it. Mm -hmm. And I just think in other countries too, that people need to look, it's kind of unfortunate to look at the example of where things have come far because then Mm. you're discouraged. Then you think, well, we're so far from that. Yeah. But I, I, when I was first asked in places like Ethiopia and Uganda and Nigeria, how, how does a country build a reading culture? Mm. I thought, well, I'm just an individual author, but I thought back that even a hundred years ago in the United States, most households didn't have books. Mm -hmm. There was maybe a, a Bible, there was maybe a newspaper, maybe Webster's Speller, but most families didn't have books. Mm. My mother didn't grow up in a household full of books. My dad didn't grow up in a household full of books. So even in my lifetime in the United States, we've managed to spread literacy quite far. And so I think maybe we need to look back to those times to think about who are some of the who, who's going to be the Ar- Andrew Carnegie of Ethiopia? Who are some of the philanthropists that might fund something like this, right? Because yeah. maybe it won't be a government institution. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it will be, but maybe it won't. That's a really good point. <laughs> um, yeah, to conclude, uh, I just need to share uh, an experience with you. <laughs> I came across your work uh, through your book, Saba about 12 years ago um you see I have a daughter named Saba and she Uh was she was about eight years old then and already an avid reader uh I can't tell you how excited I was to read it and pass it and pass pass the book to her but um the significance of that book was not only for my daughter it really inspired me to see the potential to write and produce historical fiction Ethiopian stories Um, So I would like to thank you for that. And um, just to conclude, I would like to ask you if you could uh, please read an excerpt from one of your books for us. Yes, of course. Thank you so much. (laughs) So I will tell you that in Ethiopia, the concept of intellectual property has not is not always very strong. And I know a friend of mine in Ethiopia gave me a copy of Saba that has been translated. Oh, wow. I'm sure it was done under the table because um, I don't think that the um, the publisher would give permission to translate it. But just so you know, yes. sometimes things are done in, in individual ways that yeah. um, happen. Yeah. So, and and my older sister has written a book about our childhood growing up in Ethiopia mm-hmm. that was published here in the United States. And there's a woman in Ethiopia right now who is is trying to translate it. Mm-hmm. You know, as you well know, translation is so difficult. Yes. I don't know if she'll be able to do it, but it's yeah. it's fun to think that maybe our stories can travel. So mm-hmm. I will read a little bit from oh, Saba. Oh, I'm so glad you chose that. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so this first chapter is called Fear and Disaster. 
I stopped rocking slightly on my bare feet in the cold mud at the edge of the stream. My heart was flapping as wildly as a piece of cloth caught in the wind. The strange little sound came again from the forest. A czar, it must be a czar, because how could anything except a spirit sing with such haunting, honeyed sweetness? I tried to peer into the trees that grew close together, shoulder to shoulder, an army of trees that I thought some day might tear up their own roots and march off to serve one of the faraway emperors. Mist from the day's rain was draped over the branches. Something heavy crashed in the woods for a moment, and I was still. I felt the skin on the back of my neck quiver. A leopard? Or maybe something worse. Water and forest were two of the places where Satan lived, evil and black as deep darkness with eyes of fire and horns poking up behind his ears. Emama, my grandmother, said so. Emama knew all that there was to know about such things. Izosh, I whispered to myself, have courage. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, and thank you for sharing your story. It's quite lovely when you hear that a book has traveled and you get to hear a little of its story. Because, yeah. of course, it's very hard work to write it, and then you have to just set it loose into the world and see yeah. what happens. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, and um, goodbye. <laughs> thank you for listening. We would like to hear your views and any comments you may have. If you'd like to listen to more stories as soon as they come out, please subscribe to this podcast. I would also appreciate it if you click on the like button and share with family and friends so we get more listeners. Until the next story, goodbye.